All right. Yeah. So welcome, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here um, today. We are really, really lucky to have Alex Roberts, who is the designer of Starcrossed, um, which is an award winning game um, here to speak with us today about our practice of design. Um, I know for myself, Starcross was definitely the first game I would played by Alex, but I've also played for the Queen since. And I think one of the amazing things about Alex's designs is that she really um, is able to bring narrative into games in a way that other designers um, really struggle with. So in Alex's games, even though you have a lot of agency and choices as a player to tell the story however you want, there's some overarching narrative structures that really keep everything on the rails really well. And I just think that, you know, within a genre that's so marked by improvisation, which is the theme that we're talking about this week in class, um, Alex's designs are definitely standouts. So welcome, Alex. I'm really glad that you're here. And I was just wondering if you could kind of talk to us a little about who you are, what you do, and some of your design process, and maybe we can open it up for some questions and discussion with the class after that. That sounds great. Hello, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good, nodding. Um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm very excited to talk to uh, new game designers and people actively honing their craft by taking a class in it, which sounds super fun. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm just gonna chat for like, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour, probably half an hour, because I tend to go on. Um, and then after that, I'm really excited to open it up to questions and hopefully we can get like a discussion going. So before I start rambling, I'm gonna make a request of everyone. Try to write down, like take as many notes as you want, but try to write down, type down for yourself at least one question as I'm talking. You don't have to share your question at the end. Um, you're more than welcome to, if you want to actually like ask that question, we can all talk about it, but it, I, you'll find it, I think you'll find it helpful for your own learning if as I'm just kind of lecturing, you try to just start, just formulate in your own mind at least one more question. What else do I want to know? What What's not being answered yet? What new questions am I thinking of? Um, so do that. And then after I'm done talking, we can uh, go through some of those with whoever feels like sharing. Um, so yes, hello, uh, my name is Alex. When I just hit my hand on a uh, desk. Um, and uh, I make I make role-playing games, uh, tabletop and live action games. So. Uh, I think maybe some of you have had the chance to play Starcrossed, um, and Aaron mentioned For the Queen as well, which is kind of my other big game. I also have, I've made dozen, dozens and dozens of other games like that, either at the table with friends when we feel like playing something, or that are in anthologies and collections, or that I've published on my own itch page here and there. Um, I'm trying to co-create games with more people. Uh, I just made a board game with a good friend of mine called Rat Trash Party. So if you like rats and trash, please ask me about that. Um, and I'm working on a couple games right now, including hopefully what will be the follow-up to For the Queen about a large cube. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to talk about uh, games and design. Um, when I first started playing, <laughs> um, when I first started playing games, um, I was really, really into Dungeons and Dragons when I was a teenager. Um, and I played a lot of D&D with my pals um, and, uh, and always had fun with it. And always thought, oh, this is kind of cool. This is kind of neat. And uh, then a little bit later, actually, when I was doing my undergrad, like I think most of you are, um, I got introduced to a different kind of game that at the time we were calling like indie role-playing games or maybe story games. Um, these are games like Fiasco, which I think is also on your syllabus. Um, I really, really hope y'all get to or have gotten to a chance to play Fiasco. Um, that's a game that really, really changed the way that I thought about role-playing games because rather than being built around building a, char a specific character or even world building or even, uh, you know, what am I going to get this character to do? How am I going to get them to accomplish their goals? How am I going to make this character more powerful? Instead, it was specifically about playing kind of a useless chump and making their life bad <laughs> and having things go south. And it was a game that really changed the way that I thought about role-playing games because I thought, well, things going really badly is often a much better story than things going well. I mean, when you think about the kinds of stories that you want to tell your friends, it's way funnier if things go, go sideways. Uh, 
uh, like it's fun to tell people about great things that you accomplished, but it's even more fun to tell about complete uh, chaos and uh, an abject failure, um, which is what Fiasco is all about. So that game and a few other games that were coming out at that time, things like Apocalypse World, um, things like uh, Dread, which is a really, really fun game, really started to change the way that I thought about role-playing games. And it was games like that that inspired me to, to make role-playing games. Um, uh, because I just thought, wow, there are such interesting stories that you can tell. Um, and what I've really learned since then, and something that I want to impress upon all of you that it's very easy to forget about, is that the players create the story. Your game does not produce a story. It is not like a, a machine that you can just switch on and have it automatically produce something. And very often the story of the game is not even really created in the moment of play. People tell the story afterwards, right? And sometimes they do it immediately afterwards. When you're done a game and you're all sitting still around the table and you're saying, oh man, when you did this and then that happened and were you thinking about this the whole time? Oh no, I just came up with that out of nowhere and then this happened and then that happened, right? So players tend to take moments and they take memories and they take how they feel at the end of session and then they narrativize. So that's not to say that it doesn't matter what you play because people will just tell a story. It just means that when you're thinking about designing, don't be thinking about creating an engine that somehow just makes a story on its own. Think about giving players the pieces of a story and giving them lots of fun options and instructions for how to play with those pieces. Um, and people will do this. You do not have to worry that you, you, you can have some control over the kinds of stories that they tell. And you might argue that as a designer, you can have some influence over the quality of stories that they tell, but you absolutely could not stop people from telling stories if you tried. Um, if you sit people down together for a little bit, you give people any kind of experience, they will have a narrative at the end of it. You just talk to someone at the end of the day, ask your friend, ask your roommate, um, hey, how was your day? And they might say like, oh, it was good or oh, it was bad. But if they start talking even a little bit more, like even if you just get two or three more sentences out of them, it will take the form of a narrative. People don't just list events. They don't just list occurrences. They always want to give it some kind of narrative arc, even if it's just, well, I slept in kind of late, but I made it to class on time. And then I came home and had a pretty good lunch and now I'm here, right? Even, even that is like, that this happened and then this happened and this as a result and this but that, right? There's uh, people start to narrativize very quickly. And the more that you zoom out and the more that you give people, the more that they have this need to organize what's happening with them into some kind of narrative. So if you ask someone the story of their day, they might be able to list everything. But if you even ask them this month, this year, or what happened to you in your first year of university or what happened to you um, in your, you know, your, the first couple of years, uh, after you graduated high school or what, what, what was, what was being a teenager like, right? The more that you zoom out, the more that they will really need to, in order to make sense of it ourselves, we kind of have to make stories about what's happening to us. That's just how we process our experience. It's just how we kind of like put it in such a way that we can store it. So, um, so knowing that this happens, this is great news for us as designers, because what it means is that when you are thinking about, okay, here's a kind of story that I find interesting or a, a kind of story I might like to tell with my friends at the table, so maybe other people would, you can start to break down what are the elements of a story like that. Um, and you can kind of deconstruct. And I don't mean deconstruct necessarily in like a very sophisticated philosophical way. I mean, deconstruct like a sandwich. So like, Think, think of a kind of story that you really like or that you think would be fun or that you think would be interesting or challenging even uh, to tell at a, at a table with a bunch of players and think, okay, what's in that sandwich? Okay, both sides are rye bread. Okay, that's interesting. And then uh, and first top layer is lettuce. Okay, cool. After that comes like the salami. All right, so take all of those out and then what you want to be able to give players is all of the pieces of that sandwich and a bunch of things that aren't usually in it too. And you can go, okay, I'm going to give you some pickled hot peppers too. And I'm also going to give you this spicy mayonnaise and I'm, or a spicy mustard. And, you know, think of other ingredients to give them and then make sure that you're giving players those things and saying, okay, either here you go, those are your elements or thinking, okay, how can I then give players some structure to put these together in an interesting way? Um, so uh, the, the game that I mentioned at first, Fiasco, 
it really emulates a certain kind of genre of movie, right? It's a make your own Coen brothers movie uh, thing, right? And um, of the, the game Apocalypse World, that's any kind of post-apocalyptic fiction. You kind of take that, you take the elements of a post-apocalyptic story, and then the players have some ability to kind of juggle them around, pick out the favorite parts, put away the parts they don't like, and then rearrange those, those elements in an interesting way that's fun for them. And you can do that for just about any kind of story, especially if it's really tropey, especially if it's really formulaic and like predictable. Those stories often make the best kinds of story games because it, it, if people are familiar with the genre, then they know what happens, right? So if you say, I'm making a Western game, people are like, great, there's gonna be a cowboy, there's gonna be outlaws, um, a stranger is gonna come to town. We're definitely gonna have a standoff with guns and people can immediately start to make sense of like, okay, what does this actually like consist of? Like, what is this going to involve? Um, because they've seen a very predictable formulaic version of it a million times. And so like you, people go, okay, I can make that. I could do that. Um, so if you're thinking about making a game like that, then start to think about what are the pieces? Like what are the ingredients in the sandwich that I really love? Um, if, if we were going to sit down and make a game about animes that take place in high school, these are the best anime series, right? They have to take place at high school. If I was going to say, okay, we're going to tell it, we're going to make a game. Everyone welcome players to my table. The first thing we're going to do is be like, okay, what's the name of our high school? Uh, what's weird about our high school? Uh, it's a high school where everything is, everyone is, has psychic powers. It's a high school where um, everyone falls in love before they graduate. Um, it's a high school that is in space, on a space station, whatever it is, right? And then you would start thinking about what are the character archetypes? Okay, well, who's going to play class president? Who's going to play the delinquent? Um, who's going to whatever, whatever. So I really encourage you, if you're thinking about stories that you want to see at the table, to really just spend time with those stories and really start to pick apart what are the what are the components? What are the recurring components? What are the tropes? Or, and what are the rules? Because if a rule is just if X, then Y, right? If this happens, then this happens. Um, and so writing rules when it comes to stories, you can think of them as instructions for players, but you can also just think of them as little like switches, right? Things that happen. Um, so, that's that's my that's my sandwich theory and my deconstruction theory of games. Something, um, something I kind of wish we got to do a little bit more in role playing games is and in game design is realizing that in addition to like fun tropey fiction that everyone at the table can recognize, everyone can see. Oh yeah, if you like, um, if you like mecha anime, I'm on anime kick today. If you like mecha anime, then you can play this game because you know. There's got to be a pilot and there's going to be a space battle and there's going to be a big robot and there's going to be this and that and whatever. But you can also do this process with your own experiences. Um, and you can even do it with kinds of experiences that you don't know are going to be familiar to other people, um, particularly if you notice recurring experiences in your life. If you notice, okay, what is this thing that keeps happening over and over again? Um, then you can do the same sort of sandwich deconstruction with these experiences in your life, and you can make a game out of that. Um, something that you might notice if you, I don't know if y'all have, some of you have already played Starcrossed or if you've read the text, is that it's, it's a game about romance, but it also doesn't really look very much like a romance novel. It doesn't really look like the romance genre. Um, and I hope this is surprising because I love romance. I love romance novels. I think they're amazing and super fun, but it's not actually a genre emulation game. It doesn't give you the tropes of that genre, which include um, happily ever after type stuff. In, in Starcrossed, you really don't know if people are going to end up together. You don't know if you're going to get a happy ending. Part of the deal, if I'm reading a romance novel, is it has to have a happy ending. That's just, that's just default in the whole genre. Um, but Starcrossed isn't about romance stories and it's not about romance fiction. It's about relationships and it's about what it feels like to have a crush on somebody and not know if they feel the same way and not know if you're going to be able to do anything about it. And so when players say, wow, I don't know if I could play a game like that. It sounds like it would really make you nervous, would really make me anxious, would really feel super high pressure. I'm like, yeah, because it's that's what it's like <laughs> when you like someone. <laughs> so 
I really encourage you all to like, as, a, as an easy accessible entryway, think about the tropiest fiction that you like because it's the easiest to deconstruct. It makes its components very obvious and start to pick out what are the, what are the things that happen? What are the roles that characters always have to play? What are the rules for what happens? Um, questions like that. But I also encourage you, if you feel like it, to think about recurring experiences in your own life and think about things that keep happening, th things that keep happening to you to, that always end up happening in your friend group, in your family and communities that you're a part of. Look for recurring things and ask yourself the same deconstruction questions, right? Where does this usually happen? What are the roles that people end up playing? Um, what are the rules that people seem to be following? You know, I notice every time this happens, that happens as a result. Or whenever I encounter this, I tend to do that. Um, and right, so just ask yourself about the components of recurring experiences that you notice. And also ask yourself, when do I choose what happens? When do I make decisions? Or when do people in the situation seem to make decisions? And at what point do really unpredictable things happen? Because when you're asking players to participate in telling a story with you, you need to be able to give them both. And it needs to kind of feel like it makes sense that they're either choosing or not choosing outcomes in those situations. So if you think about things that happen periodically, um, I'm thinking about a semester. I'm, I, I know all of you are in school. I'm, I'm in a graduate program right now, right? Thinking about every semester, what, what's the game of the semester? Well, uh, you know, there's the part where I feel like I'm really on top of everything and I'm very, I'm excitedly making color coded notes for every class. And then there's that period of uh, midterms where I feel like, okay, I'm like working really hard. And then, you know, there's like December 1st where somehow I'm doing the most work, but I'm putting the less effort into all of it. And my standards have completely changed. And I feel like I'm losing my mind. And I've gone from half a cup of coffee in the morning to three cups at noon, et cetera. And Think also about the predictable and the unpredictable and the choice and the non-choice, right? There are points at which I decide how I'm going to really set up my schedule, right? There are points at which I kind of make decisions. And then there are unpredictable things, right? I don't actually know what's going to be on this exam. I don't actually know when I'm done the exam, what grade I'm going to get, um, it, right? I, I don't know when completely un, unschool related things are going to show up in my life, but it does seem to happen around, around midterm season. <laughs> so this, you know, this is an example, but look at those recurring experiences of your, in your life, those things that happen over and over again, look for the choice points, look for the randomization points, and look for the roles and the rules that people seem to be engaging in. Um, so that's my advice. Um, but to talk a little bit more about narrativization and structure, which Aaron was talking about at the beginning, um, there's so many different choices that you as a designer can make about how and when things, how, how much influence you wanna have over how and when things happen in a story. And remind yourself that people are going to tell a story no matter how much or how little uh, control you give them over how things happen. Um, so some of you have read Starcrossed, which is a very, very, very tightly structured game. Um, it has eight scenes. They're always the same scenes and they always take place in the same order. There are two roles. Someone always has to play. There, there has to be two players and they each play the roles. And you're very, very tightly constrained in terms of what you can do on your turn. The turn order itself is very constrained. You go one after the other. You don't each do something on each other's turns. It's not, there, there's like a lack of spontaneity in terms of how people enact the game. And that's very intentional because I'm not just trying to tell a love story. I'm trying to tell a very specific, or I'm trying to help players tell a very specific kind of story in which they their characters feel really constrained in what they can do. And they feel very nervous about what's coming next and they feel very tightly controlled. So I want that player experience and I want a certain level of specificity. And I also want to put a certain level of rails on a game that is about closeness and intimacy, right? I'm thinking about making sure that that players have that sense that okay, I I, I 
don't know certain things that are going to happen, but I know certain things are, and I can have some sense of predictability so that I can have this ultimate unpredictability of when the tower is going to fall, what's going to happen to our characters after. So you can make choices about how much or how little structure you want to put onto those things. Um, because uh, in my other game, For the Queen, For the Queen is basically those eight scene cards, except there's like 52 of them, and they get shuffled randomly. And you are basically just playing them at complete random and people are answering them in whatever sort of turn order that they decide at the beginning. So there's almost no imposed structure at all. There's a single card that will end the game. Like it always ends on the same card, but that card gets randomly shuffled into the deck. And so that's a game where I have very little control over the narrative structure and very little control over what order things happen in, when things happen because it's a kind of, it's a different kind of story. And it's a story about, it's a story about a journey and it's a story about not knowing exactly what's going on. It's a story about getting more and more ambivalent feelings about someone. It's a story about re-examining how you feel about an authority figure. So, right, as opposed to a very specific kind of forbidden love that look, it's forb and forbidden dyadic love between two people that this happens and it's romance and, right, being really, really specific about the kind of story that I want players to tell. In For the Queen, it's just by design a lot more open. So think about that as well, right, because you're just going to have a natural instinct to structure things a certain way and to a certain degree, probably based on the games that you yourself like. So if you are just used to playing games where there's a game master and the structure is mostly up to them, but players have a lot of choice in terms of what they're actually going to do, and all of their choices are laid out in front of them, then that's like a particular kind of structure and you as a designer have a certain level of control over the pacing, which is almost nil. Um, and if that's the kind of story that you want and that's the kind of experience that you want your players to have, then, then do that. But also know that there is not like a required degree of structure. And there's almost never too much structure. Um, you know, players will have different tastes or whatever, but definitely don't have it in your mind that a game needs to have a certain kind of like, um, that you need to let people make stories or that you need to make sure they make the right stories. Just be thinking about what do I want this game to do? What's the kind of story that I want players to tell? And what's the kind of experience I want them to have? Because if you are interested in a very open-ended exploratory game, then that's the kind of, the, then you can do that. Put on as few rails as possible, right? That's handing people all the components of the sandwich and just saying, do whatever you want with it. See in an hour or whenever, right? That's very different than giving someone all the ingredients of the sandwich you really like and saying, once every five minutes, this timer will go off. And I want you to select one ingredient, smell it, taste it, think about, decide which order you're going to put it in um, and then lay them out uh, one next to each other, right? Like you can give people the same components, but then give them totally different um, ways to interact with them. So I'm talking and talking and talking at you. And I wonder how much, <laughs> I wonder how much of this is like fitting together, but if you, if you want to simplify and you want to think about, okay, how is this useful for my own game design? Really think, what are the components of the story? And then how much guidance and what kind of guidance am I giving players on how to interact with those components? So coming back to our sort of high school anime uh, example, um, it has, to, it has to be at a school and the school has to be something weird, right? And so choices that I can make as a designer would be, do I want to give people a list of five things? Say, okay, is it a school where everyone practices magic? Is it a school where everyone um, is majoring in astronomy and it's all about stars and whatever? Is it a, a high school where um, everyone is famous? Is it a high school where um, uh, everyone's an animal? I don't know, right? Like, do, do I want to give people five different examples? Choose one. Do I just want to say it's a story about a school where everyone's a LARPer? Or do I want to say, okay, it's, it's, it takes place at a high school. Decide what's weird about your high school, all, to, all, all of you together as a, as a group of players, 
right? So be thinking about the degree of control and knowing this is kind of true of game design in general, knowing that there's no right answer. There is nothing, there is no one who's going to say like, this is the correct amount of control you need to give your players. These are the correct five components. These are the right five stages that gameplay should have. Um, and anyone who wants to tell you those things is actually just making sure that you make games that look like games that have already existed. And what's the point of that? Um, if you want to do interesting stuff with design and you really want to take design to interesting places, oof, um, then it's going to involve like kind of trusting your gut a little bit and making decisions about, okay, I think this is something I want to do. I think I want it to have this much structure and I think I want it to involve this components, or these components of this genre or of this kind of fiction or of this kind of experience that I want to convey. So yeah, you do kind of have to uh, know that there's no right way to do it, which is both freeing and also a little bit terrifying um, because you are just putting things out there. And uh, the, the last thing I'll say before I wrap up is just that like, that means you get to play test. I know that not everyone is into play testing. I think there's a lot of value in just like sketching out a game idea, idea and not necessarily doing anything with it, but getting the idea out there to think about the idea. But I really, really encourage you all, mostly because play testing is my favorite part of game design, um, to as soon as you have an idea and as soon as it's even remotely playable, get some friends together and put them in front of it and ask them to play it and tell them it's not done yet, it's not perfect. I don't know if it's doing exactly what I want to do it yet, but there is just no way to tell what your game actually does and what playing it is actually like, unless you put it in front of people and actually have them play it. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my, <laughs> these are my takeaways. The people make the story, give them tool, give them pieces and give them rules and also play test, play test, play test. As soon as something is playable, get it in front of people, look at, and don't just ask them how it went, look at how it went, observe gameplay, run the game yourself and notice, okay, what parts of it did people really respond to? Where did people get bored? Where did people laugh? Were people having the reaction I wanted them to? If not, is it an even cooler reaction than the one I was planning for? If so, how do I aim towards that more? Um, so play test, revise, 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 play test your revised version and keep going. Um, you know, making a game can be an interesting and fun and satisfying experience. It is not just about the game that you end up with at the end or the experience that the players have at the end. Like if you wanna keep making role-playing games and you want it to be worthwhile and fun, you think of also about the experience that you're having and you can have so much fun playtesting. You can learn so much about people playtesting and you can learn a lot about yourself. Um, if you're looking at experiences and about media and about stories and storytelling modes that you really like and really care about, and deconstructing them and putting them back together and playing around with them like Lego. So yes, that's actually, you know what my final takeaway is just like, this can be really fun. Please let it be fun and let it be interesting. Um, and that's really all I have to say. <laughs> um, this is the point at which I would love to know if anyone has written, oh, thank you for the little claps. I love that. Um, thank you for your applause. Uh, I'd really like to know if anyone has written down a question, if anyone um, is wondering anything about what we're chatting about, please just, um, you can put your hand up if you'd like to, and I, I will call on you, or feel free to just unmute yourself. And Oh, okay, great. We have some, okay, great. Um, let's start with uh, Aaron. What's on your mind, Aaron? Hi. Um, I loved your game, first of all, thought I'd start off with that. Um, me and Janie in this class, we played it together and I genuinely feel like it was probably one of the most fun I've had with TTRPGs. We we played Fiasco before we played Starcrossed because we kind of did like a like a bulk, like let's play a bunch of these games. And both are super fun. I personally preferred Starcrossed because it felt really like vulnerable and like, I, I don't know, I felt like we bonded over it really well and it feels like that sort of game. Like if you're open with it, then you get a lot back. 
But um, something that I thought was really interesting was like the Jenga aspect of it, or like just like the wood brick part. And it like worked really well. At first I was like, huh, how does this work? And then we did it and I was like, I'm freaking out. This is about to fall. They haven't admitted their feelings to each other. Like we can't do that now. We can't do that now. And I just like, how did you come up with that? Cause it's so interesting. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So um, I remember I told you I was playing lots of different games and they were very inspiring. One of them was called Dread. Dread is, as far as I know, the first role-playing game to ever use Jenga Tower. And Dread is a horror game and it's very much about the horror genre. And so you play it in a, in a big group and it has a GM role, like a facilitator. And uh, whenever your character wants to do just about anything, it's a very, very low structure game, actually. It's a very, it's a great, great contrast. Um, anytime your character wants to do just about anything that has any sort of risk associated with it, uh, they pull a brick from the tower and put it on top. And if the tower falls, your character is removed from the game. So usually that means they die a terrible death because it is horror. Um, yeah, so this is one of the first role-playing games I ever played. The beautiful, super fun game by Epide Ravishal. Very easy to run, super fun to do around Halloween. Totally encourage you to check it out. Dread by Epide Ravishal. Um, but when I played it, I was immediately like, wow, someone should do, uh, should make a module for this. Um, Cause the modules that it came with were like space horror, kind of like alien and uh, like a slasher movie and like a Lovecraftian cosmic horror. And I thought, you know, what's really scary is when you have a crush on someone and you don't know how they feel, someone should make that. Um, and so many years later, I realized that no one will make the game that you think is cool. You have to make it yourself. Uh, and so I originally tried to just make it a playset for Dread. And what I soon discovered is that for a bunch of reasons, it kind of doesn't work exactly the same way. So the Jenga tower is the only thing that is now in common between the two of them. And I actually asked Epidiah if I could mm -hmm. uh, publish mm -hmm. a Jenga game of my own and he was very enthusiastic about it. Uh, and, and since then, there's been a couple of other games. I'm trying to think, um, the names are all escaping me now, but there are actually a couple of other role-playing games that use the tower for various things. and like comedy games, other romance games, like uh, different genres. So, so yes, that one, that one, I, I shamelessly stole from Dread and I don't regret it. <laughs> it just to touch on, it's, it's, I, I, I know like the instruction book is just like supposed to be the instruction book, but it really felt like a mechanic of it. Cause it's like funny in the way that it's written. And it's just like, it, it nails, it just nails it so well that like you want to play it so much and I, it, it's just so good i'll stop i'll stop like gushing over it but thank you <laughs> so cool thank you that that rule book was very much a collaboration um the designer brennan reese really took a lot of my excited rambling and put it into something that is actually quite clear and readable and has a lot of breathing room in it um and uh Steve Segetti and Jason Morningstar were like big developmental editors. That was the first role-playing game I ever wrote. And it, the original draft was incomprehensible. Um, so there's there's a lot of like, there's, there's a lot of reining in that happened and a lot of making things simpler and more concise. And it was, it was a fun process. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, can we hear from Alexander? Uh, hello, Alex. Uh, how do you motivate yourself and getting ideas to create new uh, game design? Are you watching movies, anime, read books, or play different video games? Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, the answer is yes, and even more. Um, something I encourage you to do if you're thinking about making games is like just keep keep your keep a page in your notes app, or keep a notebook, or keep a Google Drive like a doc open um, that you can have with you all the time, and just you know be willing to just write down, huh? I wonder if you could play a game of that. Um, because once you start thinking that way, every movie that you watch and every book that you read um, and every recurring experience that you notice, um, you will start to think about, okay, what are the game components of that? What, what happens? Um, uh, and But the other piece of that is talk to other people who are making games and who like playing role-playing games. Get, play lots of games and play play games with other people. That's really, really important. And also talk about it. I think all, all, all of the best ideas um, have probably come out of a conversation um, or have been seeded by a conversation or, um, you know, you might, you might get an idea after you watch Pride and Prejudice, you think, man, 
what would the Pride and Prejudice role playing game look like? But it, I find it, it, it kind of germinates a lot better if you start talking about it with people. So don't, you know, don't don't get the idea that you have to kind of oh, this is my idea and I hide it away. Like the more that you talk to other people who are interested in playing role playing games, or the more that you play games with them and kind of debrief after and talk about what did we like, what didn't we like, how does this work. Um, and talk about your game ideas with other people, that is what actually allows them to like thrive and grow and create more. Um, so yes, definitely like watch lots of stuff, have lots of novel experiences in your life, like go do stuff and um, try new things, meet new people. But yeah, like, and then, and talk about it, like engage in conversation around design. Even if you feel like you're really new, I don't know yet, then, you know, then just listen more and ask good questions. That's, that's my advice. Is that helpful? Awesome, thank you so much. Um, can we hear from Ed? Ed next. Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Uh, so I was uh, curious about when you're developing a concept or when you're beginning this, the process of making a game, um, how much does the feeling that you're trying to elicit in the player come to form at the beginning? Or is it more something that you kind of think of more at the end as you're adding things? Because you were mentioning mm -hmm. like the Jenga tower for um, Starcrossed. Uh, it came more out of the uh, dread, but then you're like, oh, that could work really well for, you know, a crush because of the similar feeling of dread in a way, you know? Um, so I was just curious what your thoughts were on that. Um, a lot of people think about this differently. So there's, you know, lots of different perspectives on this, but I tend to be kind of a feelings first designer. I really think about how I want players to feel and, um, but, but also don't get too attached to that either. So I think as with any kind of outcome, have it in your mind, something that you wanna explore, something I want players to think about X, or I want them to explore this idea, or I want them to tell this kinds of story or engage with this thing. Um, but also like, to me, that's the biggest point of play testing um, is to be looking for emotional response. Um, so when are people laughing? And when are people, are people crying? Um, are people, do people look confused or sad or disengaged or do they look really engaged and interested? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say like, definitely think about emotional response, but also be open to what's happening with players. And like, if your tragedy game turns out to be a comedy game, you know, that's, that might be disappointing, but it might make you go just like, oh, well, is it a good comedy game? Are they like having fun? You know, <laughs> the word, right. this thing that I thought would be really fun turned out to be like super creepy, but like, are they enjoying being really creeped out? Is it like fun, creepy? Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. But I, but I do think like, I think emotion is really important information. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, ben, you had a question. Yeah. Um, so just from your talk there, it seemed like your main focus when designing game, role-playing games, especially like Starcrossed, uh, it seems to be a focus on a narrative as opposed to something like mechanical or rules heavy, you'll especially see that with stuff with systems more like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, whereas you, and of course, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you um, wanted to have mechanics that are built to support a successful narrative rather than a narrative built to support successful mechanics. So to that end, do you think that narrative is like the most important and most valuable aspect of a role-playing game? Or is it simply the aspect you enjoy focusing on most? Um, I think it's a little bit of both, um, but I think, uh, like I said, I, th I think the narrative is kind of unavoidable. So you can, I think even in a game, uh, you know, you're. D&Ds, your Pathfinders. I mean, even when people come back from playing a game of like Warhammer 40k, right, which is like super crunchy, lots of numbers, measuring tape, the measuring tape is out, people will still come back from that experience talking about it as a story. They will still narrativize the game of Warhammer that they had. And I would argue that one of the most appealing things about Warhammer 40k is like the lore and is the story that's behind it and the characters and the archetypes and imagery and stuff. So they're not mutually exclusive, but I think what you said about mechanics that support a narrative or mechanics that influence narrative, I am really, really interested in that because I think it's very easy to get into the mindset that either a game is real, has lots of rules or it's like story focused, that it's like either or, when in fact, 
I, I like, I think of, of Starcross as actually like a really strict game in a lot of ways. Like it has a lot of rules and you have to like follow them really carefully. Um, but that's, but what they, what those rules do has to do with like, with character, with emotion, with, um, with how the order in which things occur and what the story feels like with tone, with pacing, right? All those things we associate with story. So like definitely my own bias is towards a game that like has a fun and interesting story. I'm someone who just like doesn't get super excited about puzzles, doesn't get super excited about like combat strategy type stuff. So if that's the thing that you get excited about, then, you know, you should have more of that in your game because ultimately you're the one who's spending the most time with your game. Um, but when you're thinking about mechanics, like, like definitely... Definitely think about okay. Does this mechanic support what's most interesting about my game? If that happens to be if that happens to be character, if it happens to be tone, if it happens to be uh, plot, or you know whatever it is, the aesthetics of it. Just be thinking about okay, what does this mechanic pertain to, and is that what is important to me as a designer? Is that yeah. is that helpful? Is that yeah, no, no, the, yeah, that was, the, yeah, that was, that was really helpful. And your uh, your comparison to Warhammer Forty K was funny to me because that I've played a decent amount of that and all the stuff you said about that was pretty spot on. So yeah, that was really helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, let's hear from, uh, from Eric. Do you have a question? Hello. Uh, I had some questions about play testing. Like, uh, I mean, I know for a fact, like during COVID times, play testing a video game is hard. Uh, I'm sure that playtesting a tabletop game during a COVID uh, pandemic is beyond hard. Uh, one question is like, how do you manage playtesting or just even playing like in a non-physical space, especially like that being a prevalent thing, especially in a game like uh, Starcrossed where like the tension of a physical Jenga tower falling is like a very big part of the whole experience and uh no like virtual replacement can quite like you know replicate that feeling this is such a good question this is a really really good question um because i think that the fact that most people are playing online and i don't want to actively encourage a bunch of in-person gaming um necessarily uh and, and I haven't done that much in-person gaming except like with, you know, my, my very small group and the people I live with um, has definitely influenced the kinds of games that I want to design and what I'm interested in making and how I design them. Um, so, uh, but I would encourage you to think of that as like an interesting creative constraint. So there are a lot of tools for making games online. You'd be surprised what you can do in a Google Sheet um, and have that be the thing that everyone sees while they're on like a video call. Um, and think about like, what if I made a role-playing game that only took place over a voice call? Um, what if I made a role-playing game that was played over text message? Um, uh, like, th like think about those creative constraints just kind of where you are right now. And that's what people have the most access to. So like, how could I do something interesting with that? Um, and uh, uh, a game I'm working on right now called Baseball Episode, um, in which you take your usual characters, but they play baseball now for one episode of your adventure. Um, that's a game that like, I hope that will be played around a table um, with everyone in person and we'll have paper and pens with it. But right now, the way that me and my um, co-designer are designing it is that there's just a Google sheet that everyone looks at and all your character sheets are in there. And we just assume that people are playing over video. And so we're trying to think about that as we're thinking about how people are playing. Um, and, and there's actually quite a few tools that are that are like designed for um, shared play. So I would love to plug, um, there's, uh, there's a tool called story synth. I'm going to put it in the chat so that everyone knows and they can Google it later. Um, story synth, which, um, is a tool for making games that can be played. Um, like, like you sort of have your video call open or your voice chat open, and then you have this open in browser. Um, and it's made, it was originally made for games that are very much like For the Queen, where you just have like a randomized set of prompts and then you can just click next, next prompt. Um, but there's also like, there's like a hex grid one and there's another kind of way of making games. But um, it's, it's a very, very cool tool that lets everyone look at the same thing in the same way that all of you sitting around a table would be looking at the same materials that are on the table. And I'll tell you something else. 
Um, StorySynth right now is, is uh, has a grant program that just got funded. So if you use StorySynth to prototype a role-playing game and you think you maybe might be able to finish, finish it or at least prototype it and have something released in the next six months, um, you can apply for a grant and they will give you $300 to just play with play with <laughs> their tool and put it out there on their tool. Um, so I, I've, I've used it. I'm actually using it right now to like prototype the sort of for the queen follow-up that I'm making. Um, so like it, it, it does suck to, there's, there's a million ways in which it sucks to be in a pandemic. And one of them is that I can't play role-playing games in person with people and up close and personal. And I, I can't even think about designing in a way that uses a lot of touch and contact and like breathing in people's faces right now. I just, I can't even like fathom designing for that right now, but I really encourage you to think, okay, what are the things that are being done right now? What are the, the tools that people are using? How are people communicating right now? And can I make something that is like all the more interesting or all the more different or all the more fun because it uses those tools in an interesting way? All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for asking a question. Uh, can we hear from Alec? All right. Hello. Okay, so, <clears throat> so I had a question about um, basically when approaching making like a new role playing game, um, what should like the focus or how do you go about figuring out like the balance between like how much freedom you should give the players in regards to like rules and narrative, because I know with a lot of like, um, I mean, obviously there's a vast spectrum of like where you can kind of land as far as in your role playing game, where it's like, you know, the long lasting like games that are bound out there like D, D, they have kind of this like big divide between they have all these rules but then again it's also the most like in the player's hands role-playing game out there so i kind of want to get your take on something like that that's a really good question and your D, &D example is really interesting because again people think of it as being really rules heavy but it's also very like rules optional and it's it's profoundly unstructured Right, D and D doesn't actually say, okay, well, you know, after character creation, okay, you start here. It goes like, here are some things that can happen, and the rules for if those things happen. If you happen to run into this monster, here are the things that might take place, and the rules for how you engage with that thing. So I, I, I think it's really interesting that like, there, um, you know, and we can talk about like DM fiat, right? Someone's pointing out in the chat that like. One of the rules is like, well, we're just going to give one player kind of ultimate say on what happens. And like, that's an interesting design philosophy and it produces a certain kind of play um, and, uh, and often a very beautiful form of play where the you know, story is really about wandering around and having new experiences and finding new things and, um, and, uh, and frustrating your DM very often, right? And not doing it, figuring out what, they, what you think they want you to do and then not doing it. Um, so... I would say like there is there is no answer um, in terms of the that right balance, but you will know when you play test it and when players start having the experience that you like, right? That you get excited about. So don't even think that you can really know for 100% sure in advance, but you can find out by play testing, by giving your text to people, giving your rule set to people um, and saying like, okay, just play it and like, and observing what happens. And uh, different people are gonna like different games, right? You give one person Fall of Magic and it's the most beautiful. Do y'all know about Fall of Magic? It's one of my favorite games. <laughs> um, and it's, uh, uh, it, it has a lot of interpretation um, and it has a lot of abstraction and you have a lot of narrative freedom, even though it also follows a path and the same things happen in the same order every time to a certain extent. Um, so I would say, like, think about the experience that you're trying to create and then write around that. And also, like, look at games that you like and that you want your game to be like. What kinds of things do they specify? What kinds of things do they not specify? And make sure that if you write a rule, if you make a mechanic, that it's about something important, right? Because what your mechanics are, like, what, what your rules are, say what's important in your game. So there's a reason why Starcross doesn't have combat mechanics. I'm not, I'm not saying people aren't going to get into fights, but it's not particularly important to the story. Um, as where, like, if you're sitting down to play, say, fourth edition D&D, &D, which is like 
this really sophisticated combat simulator all of the almost every rule is about like what it was about combat or is about like achieving something and going for a goal and finding out whether or not you did it so that's what's important in that game uh magic is important in that game and uh you know weaponry those kinds of things so i would say like um how like how much rules is like just the most unanswerable question but definitely ask yourself what is this game about what's important what do i want players to focus on and then okay how do i make a rule for that is that is that useful is that, does that yes, make sense yes, very very so uh <laughs> so but my main takeaway is that play testing is just that important <laughs> yeah that's that's something i'm just going to say over and over again unfortunately is like just put it in front of people just find out what happens mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for your question. Um, Kyle, can we hear from Kyle? Uh, I raised my hand a long time ago, and I'm not sure if I remember too many of the things I was going to bring up, but uh, I guess oh, yeah, I think I remember one thing. Uh, did you ever release like an expansion for StarCrossed, or like did you ever in introduce any extra content that was like? Um, we, later so uh, we sort of have a little bit. Um, one thing, gosh, I can't imagine when people will be using it again, but uh, one thing that we noticed is that um, it's it's a two player game, right? It's a very intimate experience. But um, if you go to like a role playing convention or if you want to have like a big gaming group, um, but you're like, oh, it's only a two player game, um, there's a way to create a really, really large group experience. Um, uh, you can you can download this, I think, from the game's website. I don't know exactly where it is now, um, but it's called Space Station Phobolex. So basically, there's a preset list of characters, and there's a setting in which uh, in which your story kind of takes place. And we give that to players, and we have specific ways of matching up uh, players. So you can end up playing Starcross with like 20 people, which is basically 10 tables of the game, and it's being played simultaneously and on the same space station certain things that you do in your game can influence what happens in other people's games or like influences what's happening overall in this in the space station um so that's kind of the only thing that that we ended up expanding on starcrossed for which is so much fun to facilitate it is amazing to have 10 tables of that game going at the same time all that tension in a room um and uh people playing such different games simultaneously different tones simultaneously someone on this side of the room is doing like wacky comedy someone over there is doing this like dead serious tragic romance and all of it can happen in space um <laughs> uh yeah so i think that's the only thing but I, I do think sometimes about like a different set of rule like a different set of scene cards um or like giving people story seeds and things like that like it's an, i don't know but i have just never done it i i don't know yeah, I was actually about to ask, have you considered maybe like releasing small, like, I guess, six, six small decks of scene mm -hmm. cards that you could shuffle and they would all slot into the act um, scenario um, flow perfectly well. It's just that it goes differently due to the drawing a different card from the decks two to six to or two to seven that would uh, replace the like acts between the beginning and the end yeah i was just thinking that yeah absolutely and that's the kind of thing i'd really like to do is like really again i would want to play test them right i'd want to set some people down and ask a couple of pairs of people to go through um a different set of different set of eight scenes and think okay what kind of different genre or different tone or different different general vibes could i put um that way but honestly what i really love is when other people do that like please, if there's a game that you love, go and make something different for it. Go and hack it. Make a different set of characters, make a different world for it to be played in, or like try making a new playbook um, that doesn't exist. That's just really fun. And in my experience, usually um, it rules. Uh, there's a hack of Starcrossed out there called the Coyote and the Idiot, um, which instead of being about two people in love, it's about someone who thinks, it's about a coyote and someone who thinks that they are rescuing a lost dog, but in fact just has a wild coyote in their house, which is a thing that happens periodically. Um, and so it's, yeah, there's still a tower and there's still tension. And it's, when are you going to, when are you going to find out um, that wh when is the coyote going to realize he is not being kidnapped and is no longer in danger? Or when is the idiot going to find out that um, this is a coyote that they have uh, stolen and got brought into their home? 
Um, so like, I, th- I just, you know, sometimes I want to make other stuff for Starcross, but I'm way more excited when other people do it. That's, that's, that's the end of that question. <laughs> that's about that answer. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much. Uh, Daniel, can we hear from you? Um, I just had a question about like tropes and their distinction from rules because um, earlier you were talking about how like tropes are sort of recognizable and how um, when you design a game around tropes like certain aspects are just going to be recognizable because people have been exposed to it so I wanted to know like how you decide what should become a rule if you are operating under like this um, under these tropes because for example, in if you were to design a Western game, then if you were to use tropes that are associated with Westerns, then it's possible that if you were just to let the players play within the setting without any rules, that they would just um, be attracted to certain actions just implicitly. And if you would have to explicitly like define if they had to achieve a certain goal, like um, like in Starcrest, where it's sort of the stated that the characters that the players come up with have to fall in love with each other but if that were not in a, a sort of like explicit rule then would it have to be defined as such even if it's defined under like romance tropes or like if it's recognizable as a romance game yeah this is a really good question and um and gets out a bunch of interesting stuff about genre emulation um so i would say that one of the one of the forms that like a trope or a or a, a feature you know or a component of genre can take is a rule. So if, um, uh, I, I don't know, if you wanted to make like a fairy tale game, Princess and the Frog type thing, you'd be like, well, an important part of this story is that if the if the frog is kissed, then he turns into a prince, right? That That's a rule, but it's like, a, but it's a trope, right? Like it's a, it's a rule, but it's something about the fiction. So when you're thinking about the components of a story or the components of a genre, one of those components, one of those kinds of components is a rule that when this happens, that always happens, right? When this happens, that happens. Like that's, th- like that's one of the things that can, that, uh, that can be involved in a story. I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but like some things can just be character archetypes. There's always this kind of character. There's always that kind of character. Um, but some of them can, or, or it can be a setting, a piece of setting or like a, um, uh, you know, it's always uh, it's always got um, this really fun uh, opening sequence. We're always going to talk about the the opening titles to uh, to our game, but like also when this happens, that happens. Um, so, but I, you also get at something else, which is you actually have to be pretty conscious about the kinds of tropes that you're giving people and um, and the ones that you are using in your fiction. And westerns are really really good example because sometimes you watch an old western and you're like, wow, this is a cool and interesting piece of storytelling and then sometimes you watch an old western and you're like this is just racist and there's nothing there's not really much else going on here right like the western is always a story of like this man with a gun and he's like taking this untamed wilderness and making it lawful like th- i think i think it's actually really interesting to look at media that you really like and say there's some things about this i don't like there's some things i actually don't want to be replicating um and so like that, so then you start to think like, well, what if I could tell some of the interesting gunslinger stories, but they weren't about uh, like aiding and abetting a, a, a like colonization? What if they were about something else? Or what if I, what would a Western with no guns in it look like? Um, and everyone has to just do standoffs and talk about their problems. I don't know. So like, I, I do think it's important to be conscious about like what kinds of things am I replicating from media? Because one of the most fun things about telling your own stories and telling stories with your friends at a table is that you get to decide which parts of it are going to be just like the movies that you've seen and which parts of it are going to be completely different, right? So like we're going to tell our own James Bond movie, but it's not going to be misogynist. The people who make James Bond movies will never figure out how to do this, but you and your friends could. <laughs> you really could sit around a table and just do it that way. And it would be amazing. Um, so so that's one example. Like, um, but yeah, just think think of I think I think you are right to be conscious about like which which components of the genre am I giving people and what kind of guidance am I giving people on on how to use it? Because ultimately, if you want players to do something, you do kind of have to like put it in your game 
either put it there as an option or put it there as something that has to be there. And again, like, like I said, with how many rules or which rules or how much guidance, all of that is really up to you as a designer. And it's really about the experience that you want players to have. Is that helpful? Yeah. Cool. Thanks for, thank you for asking. Um, uh, Emily, you have a question. Hi. Yeah. I just had a question about Starcross. Um, first of all, I'm like really new to TTRPG. So I really like this game. Um, I just had like a quick question on like how you came up with like, I noticed these small details of like when you're setting up the Jenga tower and you wanted it to be to the side. So you make direct like contact, eye contact with the person. And for me, for my experience when I was playing it, sadly, I had to play it online. So I didn't get the full experience. But when I told my friend that, oh, you have to turn your camera on because we're playing over like Discord, he got all mad at me. but I told him to turn on the camera anyway. <laughs> um, but like, anyway, my question was like, how did you come up with these like little details like of how like pushing the Jenga um, board to the side to make contact, eye contact and having to touch the pieces when your character is talking? Like, what did that come like very naturally to you since you're going for like the feel of the game more? Um, definitely, I think if you're thinking, uh, th this actually comes back to play testing. I'm going to be on the playtesting thing again. Um, uh, so something that's really important um, is thinking about is about like what is that experience that I want people to have, and notice at what point in your game they are having it, and at what point in your game are they not, right? So something that happened with playtesting Starcrossed was um, was noticing that when people were like having a dialogue when their characters were talking to each other, they didn't seem super like nervous and agitated and butterflies in their stomach kind of thing. They seem, oh. You're, you're, you're cutting in and out just a little right now, Alex, your, your connections. Oh, hang on. Yeah, that's not. Um, if you have just one second, let me see. Sorry about that. Um, just filling some time while Alex uh, fixes the internet. Um, these have all been really wonderful questions so far, everybody. And, um, you know, I, as as usual, I encourage you to, to keep on asking up till the end of class because this time is really precious and I really appreciate you all putting in 110% to make our guests feel welcome and to ask really smart questions about how their work impacts you. Um, uh, but yeah, another moment until Alex comes back. Let's see. Um, one thing that we might as well talk about um, just for the time being is that um, uh, there have been some questions. I see Alex is back. I'm just gonna flip it back to you in a second, Alex. Um, but I wanted to say to the rest of the room, there have been some questions about whether or not we're gonna be meeting in person starting next week as the university asks or not. And because we have so many speakers scheduled in this lineup, it's actually probably gonna be very impossible to meet in person. So we're gonna be very online for the rest of the course. I may create a satellite room with one of the TAs where if those of you are coming from another class need to go sit down and, you know, uh, plug in, you can do that. Um, or you can just use the classroom for that anyway. Um, but I, I just wanted to make that announcement to everybody. But anyways, Alex is back. So uh, Alex, you can take it away. Hello. Sorry about that. I just needed to uh, switch. <laughs> I'm on my phone now. Um, uh, Yes, yeah, so I was probably in the middle of saying uh, that you should play test things um, because all, all of those little, all of those fiddly little rules about where the, where the tower should be, um, about the fact that you have to touch the tower during dialogue, all of that came from observing people playing the game and noticing when they were having the experience that I really wanted them to have. Um, and when they were, when they looked bored or when they looked kind of disinterested or disengaged or um, when they were just kind of talking about other things. So 
um, this is one of the reasons why playtesting is interesting. And it's also one of the reasons why I encourage you to be connected to other people who, who play and make role-playing games. Because you will then when you're playtesting, you'll notice, okay, here's where it's working and here's where it's not. And then when you're talking to other people who are also interested in design, especially if they're interested in some of the same kind of games that you are, then you can put it to those people and say, yeah, right now when they're when players are doing dialogue, they seem kind of bored and they get kind of off track and it's not interesting. What would what would be different? What could change? Um, and so that's that's and again, play other games, right? Play lots and lots of role play games, as many different games as you have the opportunity to, because you will also get lots of ideas from how those games solve those kinds of problems. Um, is that helpful? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let me see. Do uh, it is more difficult for me to see on uh, on my phone who has their hand up. Right, um, um, Matthew, you can ask a question. Thank you. Uh, hi. So. You mentioned a few things that uh, I kind of want to like string together. Uh, so you mentioned uh, giving the player pieces and like pieces of story that they can build upon and that all the details that you made in your game were found through continuous play tests. What I'm, and you also mentioned uh, wanting people to like change up Starcrust in their own way. So I'm curious about one detail in particular in your uh, rule book is that I don't recall seeing the word romance, um, that it's always hidden desire. And even one of the art pieces is like, oh, I wonder if anyone's considered melting as a hidden desire. So <laughs> did you do that intent? Did you make it intentionally ambiguous so that people could play other uh, stories, kind of like some of the ones that I was brainstorming were like, um, like a stalker and their obsession, or maybe like a serial killer who wants, who has like the, is trying to hide the desire to kill someone else, or um, oh, maybe even two serial killers trying to not kill each other. <laughs> but, and then other things like that, maybe like um, a superhero trying, who wants to reveal his secret identity to his best friend, or just someone that they're interested in making friends with and they don't know how to make friends that way. So I wasn't sure if Starcraft, like, I know it's intended or it seems like it's intended to be a romance game, um, but is that all it's supposed to be? <laughs> um, this is a really, really good question. And I had actually never before this moment thought about the fact that the word romance does not appear anywhere in the rule book. That's very funny. And I'm gonna start telling people that. <laughs> Because it, part of that comes back to the fact that it's not, that romance isn't just a thing that happens between people, it's also the name of a very specific genre um, that has kind of its own conventions. So part of that is is just like, well, it's not capital R romance, romance novel romance. Um, but also, I am actually very, very interested in the other kinds of desires that people want their characters to explore. And I think, I think you're like stalker, stalked, and like serial killer victim examples, I don't think they would play super well because it has to be a mutual desire. Um, the idea of two people who want to kill each other, I think it's interesting, but like it, it, there, there's a nature of it that there's something that they both want that they cannot admit to themselves or to each other or that they are in some way like forbidden from expressing. So part of that is also because I think, uh, you know, depending on how you look at it, I think a lot of people would consider like sexual desire and romantic desire to maybe be different things or to have the intensity of a really close friendship to be a little bit different than a romance. Um, and I, I had the fortune of, of playtesting the game with people who are asexual and with people who are aromantic and making sure that there was still something in it that was interesting for them, which I was delighted about. Um, so I actually really, really do like the idea of leaving it open because something that's this is this is like secret advanced starcross play is that i think there's the opportunity for people to have some for the characters in that game to have some aspects of their feelings for each other that they do admit and some that they don't i would love to hear about someone who plays out as a story where there's like 
people who have a sexual relationship who are not ready to admit that they also want a romantic relationship or vice versa, right? People who are, are uh, I don't know, they're coworkers and they are totally happy talking about how much they love working together, but are not yet ready to talk about the fact that they wanna be real friends, not just work friends, but friends friends. So there is actually a lot of very intentional ambiguity because something I'm genuinely interested in is how people interpret my work. So I can say, I want people to have a certain kind of experience, but when, when, when people, um, when people do something really unexpected with the game, when they take it in a direction that I don't, that I would not have imagined. Um, this happens with For the Queen all the time where people are like, oh yeah, our queen was like an AI in the spaceship that we were flying around. And I was like, okay, cool. Like, you know, if you leave things, make sure that you specify what's important to specify, right? So like I said, the fact that both of the characters involved have a mutual desire that's very important to me and I do specify that and it is in the rules and that's kind of the only way you can really play it. That's very, very important to me. But actually I do get to decide as a designer that like what that specific desire is, as long as it's mutual, like go nuts. I'm, I would be delighted to hear about some, about, yeah, a, a, something that I wasn't expecting. So that's a really, really good question. Thank you for reading the game. Thank you for doing the readings. What a, uh, that's a professor's dream. <laughs> so that's another thing is, has anyone broken your game? I've heard, I've heard a lot of, like, I've been doing a lot of readings in various classes that discuss rules in games and things like that, and how um, in many games, uh, this might pertain more to video games, but I'm curious how, if it applies to StarCraft, uh, how in many games, a, a good aspect of them is being broken. Has anyone ever broken Starcrossed? <laughs> it's a good question. Um, people have certainly taken it to places that I would not have. Um, and I think also there's probably people playing it all the time who aren't who aren't um, following all the rules, right? I don't I don't get to personally um, supervise and approve. So there's probably lots of people playing it in ways that I wouldn't necessarily think are optimal or good, or I don't know, I only, you know, the thing about a video game is that you, they can be broken, but you kind of have to play them in a particular way. You have to find glitches. You have to sort of find ways to actually make it work differently. Um, but in role-playing games, you, you are kind of voluntarily following the rules. Right? Like you are actually deciding for yourself that these are the rules you're gonna follow. And I think one of the beautiful things actually about that kind of play is that you can decide at any time, we're going to ignore this rule and that rule. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it depending on the game, but, uh, but you can, and you can find out what happens when you do that, right? What happens when we, um, we don't include this rule or that rule, or we replace this rule with that rule. And that's called hacking. And that's like, where a lot of great designs come from is from playing a version of a game and then tweaking it a little bit. I mean, you could argue that that um, uh, Starcross started out as a hack of dread, right? It was taking dread and then doing a little bit something a little bit different with it. So I hope that people do. I'm I'm a huge speedrun fan. I don't know if any of you have watched like uh, uh, speedruns, but I think something to keep in mind is that like there's there's a Breaking a game can sound kind of malicious, right? Like I'm going to take your game and do something bad with it. But um, I love the idea of someone speed running Starcross. <laughs> like what's the fastest you can play? You just like go through the scenes, move, moves, moves. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I can't think of a specific example of, of me looking at something and saying, oh, you broke it, but I'd be interested to see what happens if people do. I do agree that breaking is a bit of a strong word, but uh, oh, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, it was a really great question, Matthew. Um, just being mindful of time, we're about to run out. We have time for one more question, and so Josiah, you can have the last question. Okay. Hi. Um, I was just curious. Like, what is the work schedule for a designer that designs these kind of games? Like, in the planning phase, do you like create a, a roadmap that you try and follow or something like that? So some people do, um, and uh, when you work in a team, I think it's particularly important to have something like that. Um, but my experience, personally, um, uh, is that the majority of the design, which is coming up with concepts, play testing, tweaking things, changing, like the actual designing the mechanics of the game, 
takes an immeasurable amount of time. I have woken up in the morning and written a game by noon. And I have like, I mean, I worked on Starcross for like two years. So I, maybe some people are disciplined enough <laughs> or they are, or they work better in such a way where they can say, okay, I'm going to spend this much time in planning this part and that part. But my experience is that there's like designing the mechanics. And then after that, when I need to get other people involved, then I do need to be on a schedule where I, I get the text to an editor, the editor gets it to a proofreader. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of time that it's laid out in. We review the layout. I have to hire a, an illustrator. And then after everything's in layout, the proofreader has to look at it again. And so there's kind of a point after which it becomes like any other team creative project um, that, you know, is not very different from say um, software development, or if you've ever worked in like advertising or publishing, like it's, you know, if you're publishing it, it's a publishing project after a certain point. But before that, when it's just like make a game, I have, I have no clue how to schedule that. And for me, like it just, you keep working on it. You have to put it, let it sit on the back burner for a while. I think if you really want to make great games, I also advise you to like have a few projects on the go, because if you feel really, really stuck on a game and you just don't know what needs to change or how, like just work on something else, mess with something else, because I, I have no idea how to make games in a disciplined manner, unfortunately. <laughs> I think that was a really great question um, to end things on. So uh, let's all give, uh, uh, oh my God, brain. Let's all give Alex a big round of applause for such an amazing talk. Um, really, uh, really appreciate it, Alex. Um, and it was excellent. And I think um, something that we all appreciate as part of the class. So thank you. Um, before I turn off the camera, um, uh, is it is it okay if anybody from the class wants to reach out to contact you after this class? Yes, yeah, absolutely. If anyone's interested in having a chat, please share my email with them. Love talking games, and uh, and right now the chat is just blowing up. I just saw uh, enemies to more violent enemies. <laughs> proposed as a relationship arc so yes uh if you have questions about game design um i i can't respond i can't promise i'll respond promptly but i will get excited and um and we can chat please okay that's great so if anybody um would like alex to email send me an email directly and i will get it to you that way all right thank you alex i'm gonna turn off the camera i'm gonna stick around in the room if you want to chat or anything but um uh for everybody else this has been a great class and i'll see you on thursday um where we'll talk more about improvisation